I look at culture and climate as the soil that cultivates plants and seeds. And when you have a soil that's toxic, then you try to plant seeds and they're not going to flourish, they're, they're going to die off because they're struggling to, to make it through a, a toxic soil and it's ultimately going to kill them off. When you have a, a soil that's, that's well nourished and um, lots of nutrients and supporting the seeds, then the seeds grow and they flourish. Whether it's a seed that you got from an expensive seed store or a seed you got from the dollar store, they're going to flourish because we've created and cultivated the soil that's going to support them in being successful. My goal is to have my students learn. The way they learn is through their teachers. Their teachers will only be as good as, as I allow, promote, and empower them to be. I expect my teachers to own this school, to take ownership of it, and therefore their professionalism will keep it so that all teachers are performing at top quality. They will hold each other accountable. Well, my biggest thing is to build the strongest relationships I could with students. Let them know that they are winners. Go down the hallway, hey handsome, hi beautiful, oh I love your hair today. I mean those relationships just saying something that's nice to a student each day. You never know when that student really had a bad day um, at any time. That just gives them to get a smile. To me that's, that's worth a hundred bucks every time. There is a disconnect on, on love. Some kids get enough affection, enough, enough nurturing at home. They may not need as, as much here. Other kids, there's this huge, big void. And so um, we have to be flexible and we have to talk to our kids enough to know, you know uh, who needs it and who needs it at what level. With an alarming high school dropout rate averaging 30% nationally and exceeding 50% in many communities of color, it has become evident that our education system is still failing students with the greatest needs. A growing body of research validated through student feedback has substantiated the critical importance of combining high academic standards with teacher-student relationships and an educational environment rich in developmental asset building. There are five key things that youth need to um, ensure that they become healthy adults. They need to feel safe. They need to have caring relationships with their peers and with the adults who, who support them. They need to have meaningful opportunities to engage. They need to be involved in their community and their community needs to be involved with them. And they need the opportunity to build skills and have high expectations of them. By the time I got here, there weren't a whole lot of relationships. There wasn't a whole lot of hope. There wasn't a whole lot of, you can do it. And I knew that that's where I needed to start. That's what I needed to start to build. We did a lot of research on relationships and adolescent brains and the needs of adolescents and what connects students to school. And the number one factor is a relationship with an adult on campus. And so we made the decision that if they could have fewer adult interactions, but more lengthy adult interactions that that might help. School should be a place of stability and maybe six changes in a day might be too much for them. What if we created a little more stability and we didn't have quite as many changes? Well that's a good idea but how do you do that? Well that first year my vice principal, myself, my learning coach and a team from our district office at that time said, you know, we need to study what works. And what we found was that a cool kind of program was a core model program where you have your English and history taught by one teacher. That teacher partners with another teacher who teaches math and science. They switch kids halfway through the day. They get their PE and they get an elective. What would that look like? other schools do it, it seems to work. We're finding that the single subject approach is not working for them. So often you hear teachers say, they can't make any connections. Well, how are they supposed to make connections when things are being taught in compartments? So the fact that we have more time with the kids than just an hour, you can spend more time developing stronger projects and really thinking about how are we going to look and examine this material more closely instead of just getting through it? Unfortunately, or fortunately, what that means is that you, you need a different kind of credential. So we've created an MOU that said the teachers who are single subject teachers 
we will take care of them and we will place them in other areas, other junior high schools, high schools, wherever in their subject area. And the goal there was to have teachers end up in places that they wanted to be. Many of the former teachers are extremely happy in their current positions. The obstacle was the fear of moving, the worry of that what was being done to them. It was very hard to be told your school is not working, so we're overhauling it. But I think they have come to understand that it was not a personal decision, it was not based on the people, it was based on the system was not working. I live by the three R's. Rigor, rigorous work, relationships with students, and relationships with faculty, and faculty's relationships with administration, and relevance. So project-based learning would increase the what? The relevance. The core model would do what? It would put together the relationships. And through the project-based learning, and thank God with Common Core, now with Common Core we go deeper, fewer standards, but much deeper. Then you know what? Then we have rigor. And we have those three elements. What would happen if we believe that every student, not just a secondary student, but every student, fifth, sixth, seventh, and eighth, needs physical education on a daily basis from a credentialed physical education teacher, what would happen if we built that into this model? And while every kid was at PE, what would happen if we didn't have a traditional prep period that high school teachers have? What if we call it a collaboration period? And all of our teachers have a period where they can collaborate with their peers, their grade level peers, every day. The second year we instituted an advisory program where the first 20 minutes of every day they have an advisory class. It's fifth through eighth grade, so it's mixed grade levels. We follow them, so when they come to me as a fifth grader, they're gonna leave my advisory as an eighth grader, so they would have worked with me already for four years. So I know the family, I know them. We're really trying to be diligent about holding people accountable for what they're doing. So we put out a vision statement, and we said anybody with the right credential, read this statement. Talk to the principal, talk about our style of leadership. I have a very different style of leadership than many of my colleagues. And apply. The part that really hindered our students is for them to find the connection to the school being a learning institute and seeing their, seeing their future. We put a lot of time and effort into the feeder schools to ensure when the kids got here that they were ready for high school. We had an interdisciplinary team created and what they did is they worked collectively and formed what is called the Freshman Academy where those students are all together and they're learning from that interdisciplinary team. Well the Academy is getting the kids uh, to have personal relationships as far as their grades with teachers on campus that care about them. So we had West Ed to come on and to go around to our school and to do an assessment as me being a new principal at the school giving me more information about how things were functioning at San Juan High School and in that data piece that West Ed gave us it said your, your students they're in classrooms with hats on, they're on their cell phones but yet and still they're not displaying any aggressive behaviors or being disruptive but what, are you, what does your learning institution hold as an accountability piece? So what we did is we brought together a team of people and said, what do we need to do to address the school climate at San Juan High School? And then I took it a step further and I said, I think we need to bring our students together and ask them, you know, what are the things that are creating barriers for them that are preventing them from learning? So we called together 100 students and we did what is called a Students for Radical Change conference. We gave them the rules that they were supposed to have been following. We had the students to wrestle with the, the rules that were before them, alter the rules so that it seemed like it was more about learning rather than discipline. And then they presented to the staff. These are our rules and the staff gave feedback and said, okay, we can meet you here. We understand why you would do this, but we will want to tweak it a little bit. And they created the rules for the subsequent years. Well, my honest answer is I think a lot of us were scared. I think we we're, were thinking, you know, wow, who's running the school, you know? But after you think about it, and, and you really be honest with yourself, if they're making the rules, then they gotta abide by the rules. As long as the rules make sense, 
then, hey, you made this rule. What's more powerful? This is your rule, not mine. We didn't make this, this is yours. Our first staff meeting, we continued to just provide the teachers with the data on the number of things that were going on because some of the things that we put in place to empower students uh, was things that we were told we couldn't do, restorative justice. Uh, we were told that students couldn't leave restorative justice. I remember going all the way to the, you know, down the coast trying to go to a training and when they realized that we were talking about students doing it, they decided they couldn't support us either. So I just said, we're just gonna go. We're gonna do it anyhow. We're gonna get students together and say, I, I, I believe in you. This is your school. You gotta have ownership and you have to be accountable. For Peer Digital Panel, it's a better way than just you know going to maybe staff and you know d receiving a punishment or whatever you'd get, you get to go to your peers and you basically get judged by them, you know. And I think it takes more to heart that you know that you're getting judged by your peers. I don't think anybody anticipated that it would be as powerful as it was, and that the reason why that program is so successful is because Gloria builds the strengths of students and then allows them to do what they need to do. What we showed everyone is that once we changed our school culture, then our academics also fell in line because now students are focused on learning. A convergence of recent research studies found that school climate and culture is the single most indispensable ingredient of effective school reform. This means there is a direct correlation between school climate and student achievement. Success was based not only on what the principals chose to do, but how they chose to lead, with relationships being central to the process. I believe very strongly in collaboration and participatory management. It's a very process-oriented school. It is very much a process. Thing, it, sometimes things happen a little bit slower because I need to get input from everybody. But it's very effective in that People are happy. When you give someone ownership, then they take pride in it and they value it. And I think that's the case with Roxanne. She has expectations and then she lets you work it out on your own. And the reality is most principals only stay three to five years at a school. And most teachers stay, you know, eight to 15, if not that whole school, their whole time. So you have to be able to get an environment that you're happy to work with, that that's going to work for the kids, and that's going to be sustainable even after that principal leaves. This is an age where you have a tremendous sense of belonging. You're starting to develop your social skills. In this area, historically, it's been rather tempting to want to identify with the bad kids. And when I first came here, that's what was going on. But you know, we focused on the culture through working with, with those relationships and restructuring the school and bringing in teachers who are in line with the vision. And it went away. It went away. It wasn't part of who this school was anymore. I don't have that problem anymore. When they were hiring and they were interviewing for, the, for Gloria's role. And I remember in conversations, the biggest point was, we need someone who's going to lead the school, who will hold people accountable. We need someone to, to stand up and support us, our students and our staff. She has a desire to make sure that kids do well. It doesn't matter to what degree that she has to go outside of her, her box or her scale in order to get it done. I mean. The only reason we're here is because of the students anyway. Well, to me personally, how I play basketball and she used to be a basketball recruit. We have some type of little connection together too. She's, she's also well outgoing, makes your students do what they need to do. They're here because they're part of the school and what they do and say matters. You know, there's all these programs out there that, that are research based and you know people want you to pop them into a system and if you faithfully implement them they believe they will get the results and that's not always the case because each school environment is different. A program is usually has a set time limit to it, it has a set curriculum to it or a set set of rules. Culture is how people interact with each other, culture is the norms of the school, how adults treat students, how adults treat each other. Um, Culture is the underlying thing that either makes you successful or not. So I think the culture drives everything. Without that, you're not going to get those high levels of student achievement because you're, you're trying to focus here without supporting here. It was all about school culture. Our academic part 
came because of the attention and the focus on school culture. I encourage administrators to look outside the box and do things differently, to be secure enough in themselves that they don't have to command and control everything, that they can let go and share information and resources and, yeah, power. We have to look at student development, the social emotional development. I get that it's really important that we're academically prepared, but you know what? The people who get jobs out in this world get jobs because they're well-rounded people, they have social skills. They understand what responsibility is, they understand um, how to be punctual, how to follow through. All of those things are important. So how can we teach all of that stuff in new and creative and different ways? How can we as leaders challenge our teachers to take ownership of their school, to create their working environment the way they want it to be, and to have it flourish and blossom into something that's absolutely beautiful. We did it here, and we'll continue doing it as long as we're able to. Take a deep breath, trust that good things will happen when you empower other people. The way we get to our kids is through our staff. I'm not out there teaching every classroom. Use your creativity, have fun. Enjoy your job and enjoy your kids and that's when the sparks will happen, and they do.